Inside the NFL, Bill Parcells made an unsuccessful return to Foxborough. The 49ers' Steve Young returned from a necessary week off, but questions remain about his health. There are no doubts about Denver running back Terrell Davis. He joins us on NFL Crosstalk. And we look back at Hall of Famer Ernie Stautner, a hero in Pittsburgh who never left the game. Pros Watch Inside the NFL with your hosts Len Dawson, Nick Bonacati, Chris Collinsworth, and Jerry Glanville. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this week's show. We are three weeks into the National Football League, and gentlemen, I think we would all agree the surprise team is the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Tony Dungy is their head coach. They are currently 3 0. No, Tony Dungy is a very quiet guy. I asked some of his ex players, I said, hey, does he ever yell? said, yell. I've never heard him above a whisper. You know, coaches, though, in general, I think, are changing in the National Football League. You used to think of coaches in this league, Vince Lombardi and Mike Dicka. Well, now Mike Dicka is not even Mike Dicka. <laughs> it's a kinder, gentler National Football League. And I think that it shows guys like Tony Dungy. There's a lot more player coaches. Now the coaches are asking the players' opinions as opposed uh, to just uh, telling them what to do. You know, Chris, you're absolutely right again. Once He's again. always right, right? I mean, guy like Bill Parcells, uh, right? Uh, all you have to do, kinder, gentler coach. <laughs> Ask Adrian Morell when he was fumbling the football. He went right down his throat. And of course, there are other kinder, gentler like coaches who? around, like Jimmy Johnson, Ray Rhodes, and Tom Coughlin of the undefeated Jacksonville Jaguars. You're Jacks. unbelievable. Yeah. Did I say every coach in not the league? No, no, I did not. I said the majority oh. of coaches now in the league yeah, yeah, are yeah, players' sure, coaches sure. and not the tough guys. Yeah, well, yeah. the problem with you two, neither one of you have ever <laughs> coached. Here's a couple of players talking about the coaches. The only thing that's a factor for the coaches. Who has the authority? Can the coach cut the players? He can be kind. He can be mean. He can be whatever he wants to be. But if he doesn't have the authority, then he's got to find a way to get those players to play up to me if he has to hug his like kids. That, though. That's the problem. <laughs> you know, pro coaches now are becoming more like college coaches. They have to go out and they have to recruit these players, and that is because of the salary cap. You know, a player can choose whatever team he wants to go to, so the coach has to go out and whine and dine him and say, please come with me because I'm going to make life easier for you but you know let me ask you something what type of coach would you like to play for? Oh, very simple I want a coach who is going to have players on the field who are going to play today I don't want a coach who's going to go out for this guy who has potential and three years from now you find out he can't play I want the guy today I always thought Nick had a lot of potential didn't you I think he's lost his potential <laughs> but I always like to play for a guy and I hate to admit this Lenny that chewed me out from time to time. Whenever I got mad on the football field, whether it was because something somebody said in the newspaper, a guy took a cheap shot, or the coach was screaming at me, that's when I seem to play better. That's why know. you do so well on this show, because he's always <laughs> That's right. You know, about a week ago, I got to be in Jacksonville, and I interviewed Jeff Lagerman. He used to play for the Jets. I said, why would you move out of New York and come to Jacksonville? He said, one reason is Tom Coughlin, the head coach, guaranteed me nobody would be a dog. Everybody would have to work Everybody have to show enthusiasm for the game, and I think there's a lot of players like Nick that they look for that. We could spend the rest of the day arguing right. this point. I think it's evident that both types of coaches will win in the National Football League. Personally, I want a coach who's going to set down the laws and abide by the laws. If somebody breaks them, he's going to pay the price. For example, if a guy's 15 minutes late to a meeting, I want the coach to undress him right now because that guy I'm going to have to play with on Sunday. Fortunately, I had a coach like that, Hank, Hank Strand. Strand. Mm -hmm. But he had the audacity he wants to find me. Can you believe that? <laughs> I think more of them now. <laughs> You know, each week we put a microphone on a current player to give you the opportunity to hear what it's like on the field during the game. This week in the Vikings-Bucks game, we give you the story of a man named Brady, Vikings linebacker Jeff Brady. Pelting a total 
stranger with fruit is one of the temptations of childhood. Thank goodness we have athletes for role models. You guys stay out of trouble. You guys see any buccaneers, throw some stuff at them, all right? There you go. <laughs> all right, see you guys later, okay? I gotta get going. Over the years, the lowly Buccaneers have been pelted with all manner of objects. But in a battle for the division lead last Sunday, they threw their best at linebacker Jeff Brady and the Vikings. In the second quarter, the Bucks were driving. like pushing the pile, you know? I know. Next thing I know, I just like square, like I just come outside just to see what the play is sitting right there on me. The Mikes were also frustrated by Trent Dilfer, who is now the NFC's top rated passer. This is the ball, touchdown Tampa Bay. Copeland takes it in, and Dilfer is throwing perfect strikes in the North Country. <laughs> but they're, they're daring us to pass in that in the slot formation. They're putting eight guys in there. But in the fourth quarter, it wasn't three and out for the box. It was one and done, as in Warwick Dunn. A little inside handoff on a delay to Dunn. Dunn breaks the tackle. Dunn tries to get out of there. Dunn's getting the corner. 45-40, 35-30, 30, 25-20, 15-10, 5, touchdown, Tampa Bay. Warwick Dunn, 52-yard run. A little guy does it again. With over 100 yards for the second straight game, Dunn has provided plenty of bang for the Bucks. I hand it off when I'm at the end, and I go, wait a second, he's got a chance. Hey, I'm glad you scored this week so we can't make money on getting tried. For Tampa, this game was strictly 3D. Dilfer, Dunn. Come on, Brad! And a bruising defense. Johnson drops. Nailed. Holy cow, is he hit. By the time this late bomb to Chris Carter found its mark, the Bucks were on their way to 3-0, their best start in 18 years. It's a new Buck team, baby. Right. And this ain't the old Bucks. It's a new Buck team. 97, whole new team, baby. It's our day today. We did a great job. Nobody can take that away from us. So let's enjoy the plane ride. Let's enjoy the fact that we won. But this was a business trip. We came up here to take care of business. We took care of business. Now we go back home, celebrate it one day, and then we'll get ready for Miami. Surprisingly, the NFL record holder for touchdown passes had gone the first two weeks of 1997 without one. And with Craig Erickson looming, Dan Marino faced a perilous visit to Green Bay. But amidst the furious pass rush, Marino stepped up to be the all-pro that he is and proved that touchdown passes do come to those who wait. While the Dolphins moved through the air, the Packers offense methodically ground the Dolphins into the Lambeau Field side. Dorsey Levins rumbled for a career-high 121 yards, while backfield made William Henderson's touchdown douse Miami's upset planes for good. Back in the pocket, here they come. He flips it, he got a man open, Henderson at the five, touchdown! The Packers' win was a sight for sore eyes as Green Bay scored its first ever win over the Dolphins. The Meadowlands was a magic kingdom for the Ravens, and Vinny Testaverde came out looking like Hercules with a scoring strike to Derek Alexander. The 
the Giants' offense fought back and built a 23-14 fourth quarter lead. With time a factor, Testaverde and Eric Green combined to put the Ravens deep in Giants' territory, setting up a scoring pass to Michael Jackson, which cut the Giant lead to two. Vinny back to throw. Pump fakes, throws back in the corner of the end zone. Jackson got it. Touchdown. Yes. Yeah. The Giants then gave Brad D'Aloiso a chance to pad their lead in the final minutes. It is no good. Two missed field goals. A blocked extra point. That's a lot of points to leave off the board. With seconds remaining, it was left to Matt Stover to kick the game-winning field goal. Kick. It's good. Stover drills it right down the middle. Stover's kick gave the Ravens their first road win in their history while handing the Giants a heartbreaking defeat. Coming off a heartbreaking loss of their own, the Rams gave the ball to Lawrence Phillips and stayed out of the way, as did the Broncos on this 23-yard run. Breaks the tackle, stays on his feet. He's to the 15, he's to the 10, he's to the 5. Touchdown, St. Louis. Lawrence Phillips stays on his feet. Guys, let's put this fire out right now. Michael, they're going to work you now, scooping you. The Bronco defense sacked Tony Banks five times and left matters in the hands of John Elway. The field of ball is going to be cut. Over the middle and running wide open is going to be Rod Smith. And Smith is gone. He's gone for the touchdown. 72 yards. Woo! 72 big yards. Unbelievable. Elway threw for 247 yards and four touchdowns as everything Denver did seemed to end up in the end zone. Backs him up all the way to the six. Here comes Gordon to the 10. Gets a block. 15. Darian Gordon breaks the tackle. 20. Still on his feet. 25, 30. 35. Gordon, 45, 50. There he goes. Darian Gordon is going all the way to the end zone. Touchdown, Denver. While the Broncos routed the Rams convincingly, the victory did not meet the high standards of Denver's demanding head coach. So pass lofted to McCaffrey. Oh, what a catch. Eddie McCaffrey in football and we played we played but we still won the football game and won it going away in the second half as long as you guys understand that we got a chance to get better but we have got to get better lost a little discipline in that what first quarter too many penalties we stopped ourselves we can't do that and achieve the goals we want to achieve well one guy Mike Shanahan can't be disappointed with is his running back Terrell Davis three straight 100 yard games to open this season and Terrell joins us now on NFL Crosstalk Terrell, the season ended so abruptly for you guys last year with that loss to Jacksonville. What did that loss do to your football team? Well, I think right now it, it, it's making us more focused. We know what we have to do going into this season. We know that we have to put ourselves in a, a situation to where we can get back to the playoffs. And, uh, you know, hopefully uh, that game will remind us that, you know, when you play that game, there's only one game and you're out. I mean, there's no, there's no tomorrow, so we have to play well. And right now I think people are reminded of that. Okay, last week you got the game one. It's late in the fourth quarter. What are you doing in there carrying the football? I don't know. That's what you call your cheap yardage, I guess. I mean, you know, I was close to, I, <laughs> I was close to, to 100 yards, and, and Mike Shannon had told us before that if a back was close to 100 yards, at like 98 yards, to let him know, and uh, he'll, he'll make sure that the back gets 100 yards. So uh, that's what we were doing. And hopefully uh, the thing, the objective is not to get hurt, and, uh, you know, so far I haven't. I know you have to be one happy guy that your big offensive tackle, Gary Zimmerman, came out of retirement. Oh, yeah. I'm elated. And uh, I know John is probably more so than I am right now. So, uh, you know, that, that solidifies our line with Gary back. And, uh, you know, we're looking forward to go forward. What are you doing with your migraine headaches? Anything different from last year? No, I'm just taking a medication. I'm taking uh, some preventative medications to where I, I take it before I work out. That's basically about it. My diet's the same. I uh, continue to do the same things, but uh, like I said, I just take that, and, and if they come on, I have some, some medication that I take to avoid it once they come. But other than that, I still live basically the same life. I keep hearing that John Elway is happy that you're running the football so much. Do you really believe John when he says that? <laughs> you have to. I mean, the guy, you know, John, is, uh, he's had his days where he was throwing the ball uh, to, to really keep Denver going. So right now, I think it's good for him to sit back and let the running game take over sometimes. But last week, John, it, it was John's day. And, uh, you know, not so much for the running game, but the passing game opened wide up. So I think different weeks is going to be different type situations. We might be able to run the ball uh, more one week than the, than the other. So I, I'm sure. John's going to get his days to throw the ball as much uh, as he can. 
with all the blitzing you're going to face this week against the Bengals, what are your new responsibilities for this weekend? I have a lot. I have a lot. I have a lot of, uh, you know, blocking responsibilities. So this game, I'm going into it with, with more of an open mind of the, not just being a runner, but being a, a blocker and a receiver. So uh, they do a lot of stuff on defense, so we have to uh, be disciplined to pick that stuff up. Terrell Shannon Sharp was injured uh, last week, his ankle, and uh, he's had a lot of problems with that ankle. Uh, what's going on with his situation? Uh, I think he's looking pretty good right now. I'm not sure if he's practicing or not. I don't think it's a, it's a severe injury. So hopefully he'll be back this, this Sunday to play. Uh, if not, then, you know, Dwayne Coswell and Byron Chamberlain, uh, they came in last week and stepped it up and played well. And we expect the same for them this week if uh, Shannon's not able to go. When you look at that Cincinnati Bengals defense, they really have not been able to get the kind of pressure on the quarterback that you would expect out of their blitzing type of scheme. Have you come up with any idea of what their problems have been on the defensive side? No, not really. I think they do a lot of stuff that's, uh, you know, it, it, you might at, at times question why they do it, and a lot of stuff it might not seem sound, but uh, it's kind of stuff that if you don't, if you're not prepared for the defense, it, it will get to you and get to you fast and, and often. So, if you can pick it up, I think that uh, you know, I don't know if they'll they'll bring it as often, but you know, I really can't pinpoint and say that this is why they're having problems on defense. I really can't answer that. All right, Terrell, thanks for taking the time to be with us. All right, thanks a lot, Chris, Jerry. All right, Jerry, this week the Bengals travel to Denver. Never easy to get a win at Mile High Stadium. Well, this time of year, you got to love the Denver offense. They have a commitment to run the football. They'll do that for the next couple of months. Down the road, I don't like it, but right now, I'm going with the Denver offense. Oh, Mike Shanahan learned his lesson last year in that playoff game. He's going to continue to run the football, but the big difference with the Denver Broncos has been the play of that defensive line. Keith Trailer has taken the double teams away from Michael Dean Perry. Now very balanced across the front and very difficult to handle that defensive line. I like the Broncos. Lenny, who do you guys like? Well, Chris, thank you very much. Well, I see you're listening yeah. very closely to our experts over there, but I want to know what Nick Bonacani thinks. Lenny, I'm beginning to feel sorry for Cincinnati's quarterback, Jeff Bonacani. Wait, wait a minute. You've <laughs> never felt sorry for any quarterback <laughs> any time. Well, I am this week because the offensive line of the Cincinnati Bengals, especially left tackle Rod Jones, is really in the shambles. He needs help on every single pass play. This week, he goes against Alfred Williams. Boy, that's a mismatch. You couple that with the fact that Neil Smith had two sacks last week. Kajana Carter can't run. So the running game is in the toilet. Poor Cincinnati. I love Denver. I knew you'd give me the inside scoop. You know, I like Denver as well. Elway off to a great start. Terrell Davis off to a great start. Let's not forget about the special team play of the Denver Broncos. Last week, 94-yard kickoff return by Darian Gordon. Their punter, Tom Ruin, got into the act. He averaged better than 47 yards per punting attempt in that thin air at Mile High Stadium. It's going to be a long afternoon for Cincinnati. But, you know, playing in Denver... You can be assured of a great stadium atmosphere and a very supportive crowd. You can't say the same in Chicago anymore, where fans are turning on the Bears in Soldier Field. Any hopes that 1997 will be a banner year for the Chicago Bears are fading fast. The Windy City's windless woes continued last weekend as Detroit finally turned Barry Sanders loose. Sanders, who had gained a mere 53 yards in the season's first two games, rushed for 161 yards at Soldier Field. And Scott Mitchell fired two touchdown passes in a commanding Detroit victory. Mitchell back to throw it. Long post pattern. While Detroit fans hope the Lions can duplicate the success of the NHL Red Wings, the Bears are definitely skating on thin ice. Last Sunday, a little grilled tuna replaced sausage, ribs, and burgers on the tailgate party menu. And Patriot fans hope to light a fire under the big tuna as Bill Parcells returned to New England. Parcells' new team was seared by the key members of Parcells' old team. After three games, number 28 Curtis Martin tops the NFL with 87 carries, nearly 20 more than the back in second place. Against New York, Martin rushed 40 times for a career-high 199 yards. Drew Budsoe has also thrived since Parcells' departure, and the league's leading passer welcomed back his former coach by throwing for a pair of touchdowns. But Bledsoe was intercepted twice. Let's show off play action to throw. Fires re intercepted. Picked off by the New York Jets down the right sideline as linebacker Mo Lewis going all the way for a touchdown.
In the fourth quarter, the Jets drove 83 yards for the game-tying score. From the 24, O'Donnell is teamed down by seven, looking for the end zone, looking for Keyshawn, makes the catch, touchdown! Wow, what a play! When the Pats fumbled away the ensuing kickoff, New York attempted a 29-yard field goal with 16 seconds remaining. The ball is down, the kick is blocked! The kick is blocked! Holy Toledo! John Hall's field goal attempt is blocked! In overtime, Pete Carroll called on Adam Vinatieri to maintain the Pats' perfect record. Ready to go. Snap, ball down, kick up, on the way. remain undefeated, but not without a very, very good fight from Bill Parcells, New York Jets. While there are no crybabies on Parcells' improved Jets, Atlanta fans feel that former Falcon Jeff George has displayed infantile behavior and deserves a dose of corporal punishment. But George pacified the crowd by passing for 286 yards and a touchdown. Pass. Looks one out here, deep downfield, left for Jet. Oh, he got the ball! Inside the 15-10, he scores a touchdown. James Jett with a tremendous catch. George had fun playing with a little jet, and his toy box also included a miniature soldier named Napoleon. Five foot nine inch Napoleon Kaufman, number 26. Across the 40, first down, 45. Into the secondary. 45 trying to get outside 40. 35. He's gonna go. 25 gets a block. 10. But the Falcons also have an exciting young runner of their own, rookie Byron Hanspard, number 24. Hanspard's 77-yard gain set up a touchdown, and winless Atlanta battled until the end before yielding to a Raiders team that earned victory number one behind Kaufman's career-high 140 yards on just 14 carries. Hands off, Kaufman breaks tackles. What a runner, 45. While Kaufman was this game's brightest star, Jeff George was not shy about grabbing the spotlight. He took a victory lap around the Georgia Dome, just to let the locals know that the quarterback they thought should be wearing diapers had just administered a big, loud spanking. A week after his first win as head coach of the 49ers, Steve Mariucci was looking for victory number two at home against the New Orleans Saints. Look at you, you got them sleeves rolled up, put a pack of cigarettes under there like Fonzarelli. All right, coach. Right from the opening kickoff, it was happy days for the 49ers. All right, Chuck. We're gonna get a good one here. Chuck Levy's 59-yard return of the opening kickoff set the tone for the 49ers and proved to be the beginning of a long day for the Saints. That's the way you start a football game around here. That's the way you start a football game. That's the way. Okay, now listen, I'm in this series, I'm going to stay with... Is this fun or what? It's just really, really... All right, now listen, we're going to go Tiger 94. Let's go get some push. Tell Gogan to block somebody and knock them, knock them back, all right? Steve Young's return to the starting lineup sparked an offensive explosion. San Francisco soared to over 300 yards of offense by squeezing every inch out of every first down. What do you guys think? We get it? I think so. Huh? Get it right where it's needed. It's cool. It all depends on tight ends. That doesn't committed, look like it committed. from here. Got in the this is like, this is like way off compared to that one. I always make it a little hey, longer, tell so them so you, you get it. You want to go 200 Jet X Lego Z seam here, or do you want to be methodical? <laughs> Let, let's just let's go after him. Make a good. You don't like it. You don't like it. You got your tight end. Yeah, you got your check down to your tight end too, right? All right, let's go. Oh yeah, do it. This is a touchdown. This is a touchdown. This is a touchdown. Steve Young drops back the throw. Throws down the left sideline. Alone. Front Jones. Touchdown. 49ers. And a baby. When are you gonna start shaving for these games? This is the first time I've not shaved in all my career. I figured I'd change hey. it up a little bit. Oh, I like it. All right, get the burly look. The 49ers defense also had a burly look as it forced eight Saints turnovers. We got it. We got it. We got it. We got it. 
San Francisco recovered two fumbles and intercepted six passes. Coming hard on Schuler. Takes his time ball deflected up in the air, deflected again. Intercepted by Woodson. Down the left side of the court. Come on, Rod! Come on, Rod! Rod Woodson picked off three as San Francisco's defense totally dominated the Saints. That's the way to get after that quarterback. That's the way to get after that quarterback. New Orleans managed six sacks, but never when it mattered most. Okay, now listen, we'll go past 65, okay? okay. But if it's not there, you are throwing it up to my twin brother up in the bleachers over there. Okay? Yeah, yeah, twin brother? No, no I don't. Throw now. All right, let's go. Young's third touchdown pass, this one to Garrison Hurst, helped seal a 33-7 route of the Saints, while also creating the kind of chemistry that the 49ers will need when they face the stiffer challenges that lie ahead. That's a first. I really appreciate that. That's a first. Don't mention it. Nice job, baby. I owe you. That's true. Nice job. Steve Young told his coach, I owe you one, but at this point in Steve Young's career, he doesn't owe anybody anything. Now the question is, what makes a quarterback continue after three concussions in 10 months? We sent Andrea Joyce to the West Coast to find out. It is the world's most violent sport, and no one knows that better than 49ers quarterback Steve Young. Everyone knows too many hits to the head is not good. It's probably not natural to go out there and take a beating. You know, you have to kind of be in a little bit of denial to play. Young was back at it last Sunday, a victorious comeback with impressive offensive stats. But the five sacks he took loomed large, constant reminders of his medical predicament. After suffering a third concussion in 10 months in the season opener, a neurologist and a neurosurgeon gave Young the green light to play last week. At 35, he's still one of the NFL's greatest warrior quarterbacks, but with his propensity for head injuries, Steve Young may be entering a danger zone he can't scramble out of. In Steve Young's case, um, the concussions he had were extremely minor. There was no evidence of permanent injury. If he sustained another concussion, he should seriously consider his options. And in talking with Steve Young, I think he would uh, assume a reasonable approach to, to the situation. You only get so many of those. Lightning can strike only a few times, and then it's not lightning anymore. It's something that happens too often. And as long as I can put enough time between these lightning strikes, I think that uh, we'll be okay. That may be harder and harder to do. Turning 36 next month, as he gets older, Young's mobility slips, and right now his front line of protection has never been weaker. Meanwhile, back home in Utah, family concerns for Steve's health have never been stronger. Mike Young, an ER doctor, has mixed emotions about his older brother's return to the field. As a doctor, I feel like an objective point of view that, you know, this is crazy, Steve, you gotta quit. <laughs> but. Uh, as a brother, I know how much he loves to play the game. There's a quest, I think, that is uh, totally engrossing to me. Emotionally, physically, uh, the challenge is so great to play great NFL quarterback. It is so hard to do in my mind, and to keep doing it over time, it's, uh, it's engrossing. It is, a, it is a addictive in many ways. But I think this experience broke the first step of uh, addiction is a denial, you know, and I think it broke that. He's got so much potential to do other things in life, and I don't want him to lose any of that because he's because he's worried about, you know, doing well now. So now, number eight must do anything he can to protect his head. Young's opted for a mouthpiece to absorb shock and a better-fitting helmet with more air and padding. The last thing they want is him running. He's running on the first play. But precautions do not mean prevention, and Steve Young is fully aware of what has happened to men like Muhammad Ali and Al Toon, athletes paying the price today for too many hits taken yesterday. I don't want that. If medical science said to me that's strong possibility, I would run. I don't, I don't want to be impaired. I, my brain is, I've been blessed with a pretty good one. I want to use it. I want to pr be productive in society and do even uh, even greater things. There is little left to do on the football field for the most accurate passer in NFL history. And even though Young still cringes at the word retirement, he knows it's a reality he will have to face. 
this last week that I had off, I had a lot of time to reflect. But I've become much more at peace about it, uh, recognizing that I love to play. I have my heart has a lot of football left. Uh, my body's going to dictate how long that is going to be. I kind of have high hopes. I don't know if this is possible, but, you know, on your tombstone, say Steve Young did this, this, and this, and oh, by the way, he played some football. For now, Steve Young, one of the game's greatest decision makers, continues on each Sunday, hoping he'll know the right time to make his final call. Awful lot of people are concerned about the health of Steve Young. They think he should retire from football right now. One person concerned is his brother, who happens to be a doctor. You know, I don't blame him for being concerned. If you think about this situation in terms of boxing, if a boxer went out and got knocked out and tried to come back and fight later that day, or even the next week, there'd be such a public outcry to ban the sport. But because it's football, somehow it's all okay now. Well, the National Football League should adopt the Big Ten rule. Years ago, Woody Hayes fought for the rule. If you got a head injury and had to leave the ball game, you couldn't come back in that ball game. But you know rule. something? People are wondering, why does a guy who has almost $30 million in the bank put himself at risk? I think it's pretty simple. He's almost 36 years of age, but he's only had success in the last five years. He's won one Super Bowl, but as a football player, he feels unfulfilled. He's almost 36. I was 40 when I played. He has $30 million in the <laughs> bank. I guarantee you one thing, I would not be behind that center at age 40 if I had $30 million in the bank, not with the teams that I played with. You know, there is another quarterback who's had his fair share of injuries, but not life-threatening. That's Dan Marino. Dan Marino and his Dolphins in a very important game, traveling to Tampa Bay to take on the Bucks. How do you see this game? Well, the biggest surprise for me for Tampa Bay is their wide receivers. They got a Horace Copeland finally making some big plays, and a rookie, Rydell Anthony, they continue to surprise me and for that reason Tampa Bay goes 4-0. You know that's a good news for the receivers but the bad news for the Dolphins are they they got a couple receivers Jordan and Barnett they sort of need to grow some inches on their arms because they get a little short arm when they try to alligator go across arm? the alligator oh. arms maybe the shirts <laughs> a little too no the shirts yeah, a little too tight and that's why they can't reach out and catch the football <laughs> okay. but I think it's these guys here they have to turn the thing around for the Dolphins I think the Dolphins only shot is they go to a double tight end single back that's still not going to be enough I like Tampa Bay. How about that celebrity pick of the week? You don't yeah. run out of friends? Yeah, no, what no, 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 no. I almost forgot about that. Matt Lauer of the Today Show. He's oh, my golfing buddy. I don't show. know. So he he likes Tampa buddy. Bay because of the three Ds. Dungey, Dilfer, and Dunn. Are you done? I hope he's done. Well, well done. I feel better, yes. <laughs> I like the Tampa Bay Buccaneers as well, not because of Trent Dilfer and their offense. That's all overblown. Because of their defense, some great young players there, Derek Brooks, Warren Sapp. I still can't believe what they did. Going into Detroit and Minnesota and shutting down those two very good offenses, I like the Bucs. I like Tampa Bay because of their offensive line headed by tackle Paul Gruber. One sack on the quarterback so far. Also, uh, Warwick uh, Dunn, two 100-yard rushing games in a row. I like Tampa Bay. The Dolphins and the Bucks have a combined record of 5-1, and one, which makes this matchup look real good, unlike the game last Sunday in Indianapolis between two winless teams. If there's one man father time can't seem to catch, it's Warren Moon. Last Sunday, the 40-year-old quarterback became the oldest player in NFL history to score a touchdown, and he seemed to step ahead of the Colts' young whippersnappers all afternoon. That guy's not 40 years old. <laughs> I'll tell you, he's running like a 22-year-old out there right now. And passing like one as Moon completed 24 of 38 for 270 yards. The Seahawks' defense, on the other hand, features some new blood in linebacker Chad Brown. Brown recorded three of Seattle's eight sacks against a woeful Colts attack that has yet to score an offensive touchdown this season. This is turning into two straight disasters at home. The Seahawks ran all over the Colts as old Warren handed off to a younger Warren to complete the blowout win. He's gone. 20, 15, 10, 5, touchdown Seahawks. Here's Warren. Is he While the NFL's oldest player isn't ready to sit back and sign Social Security checks just yet, one of football's brightest young quarterbacks was finally penciled back into the lineup last Sunday. Kerry Collins looked to help the Panthers regain a firm grip on their offense, but at times it seemed neither team had a grasp of anything. In a game that saw five fumbles, the Chargers lost four of them, and eventually Collins took hold of the Carolina offense. 
Tight end Wesley Walls scored twice and has now scored all three of his team's touchdowns this season. While the Panthers have come to count on Walls as the centerpiece of their offense, the Chiefs were without the cornerstone of their defense last Sunday. Derek Thomas was sidelined with a strained tricep, and with the Chiefs star linebacker out, the Bills look to flex their big play muscle. And here's a flea flicker, long downfield, Andre Reid waiting for the ball, he's got it, down to the 30, still on his feet at the 20, and still on his feet at the 15, down to the oh. 10, to the 5, he is in for the touchdown. That was a spectacular play by the Bills. Chiefs return man Tamarek Vanover finally got his team in the end zone in the fourth quarter. By Vanover at the six. Wedge set at the left hash mark. 20-25. Yes, yes. Vanover 30. He breaks to the outside. Tamarek Vanover. It's going to go all the way. Touchdown. Touchdown. Kansas City. 94 yard kickoff. With Kansas City holding a six point lead in the final seconds, the Bills had one last shot at a win. But pressure from reserve linebacker Troy Dumas helped seal the Chiefs' victory. Back to throw, Collins turns left, throws it for the end zone, and it's broke intercepted, intercepted by Marty Mouse. Chiefs are going to win this football game. They've been picking on Mark McMillan all day, and Mighty Mouse comes up big with an interception in the end zone. For the second straight week, the Chiefs won a game decided in the final minutes. They may need to count on another strong finish this week in Carolina. Coming up on HBO's Inside the NFL, the Cowboys get a late touchdown to beat the Eagles and the look back at Ernie Stockton, who was a Cowboys assistant coach for 22 years. The NFL sure didn't do the Chiefs any favor. They have a second toughest schedule in the National Football League. They have one loss. That was to Denver in Denver. And things aren't going to get any easier this week. They travel to Carolina to take on the Panthers. And the Chiefs offensive line wanted me to thank you because last week you said they didn't have a chance against that pass rush of the Buffalo Bills. You fired them up. That was just a mirage. They couldn't possibly do that again. Although I will say Glenn Parker for Trezell Jenkins helped that right tackle. But this week they go into Carolina and they have to take on a very tough pass rush. They have Andre Royal. Michael Barrow really brought the heat last week against San Diego and this week they get Lamar Latham back let's see Kansas City do it again I like Carolina well, I think the Panthers have way too many injuries all the linebackers got hurt and now they get the quarterback back and Moose in Muhammad the number one receiver he breaks his wrist he's out for four weeks that leaves the quarterback Wesley Walls he's on a bad sprained ankle Kansas City will shut down a run. They'll win the football game. Uh, Kerry Collins doesn't have any famous idea who Muhammad Musa Muhammad really <laughs> is. I mean, no, no. Last year he missed almost the entire year Muhammad an did. And in the first two games uh, this year, Burline was the quarterback and not Collins. So it makes any difference to him. Anthony Johnson's injury, I think this just opens up an opportunity for Tim Biotta I think he's going to really take the ball and do some damage. But it's going to be a low scoring ball game. It's going to come down to special teams. Carolina has two of the best. The field goal kicker, John Casey. And the guy who's leading the league in, in kickoff returns, Michael Bates, 33-yard average. I like Carolina. Special team play. You didn't see the Chiefs game last week. Tameric Van Over, 94-yard yep. kickoff return for a touchdown. I mean, he didn't He's, fumble this time? He didn't fumble this time. He's had five plays that run for touchdown, either punt return or kickoff return in his three years in the league. Big difference in Kansas City right now is the play of their defense. They have a whole new defensive scheme. The concern going into the season was the safeties because they, they put in Reggie Tung and Jerome Woods, second-year players. They didn't know whether they could handle it. They are handling it, handling it very well. I think it's going to be a low-scoring game, but I think Kansas City has enough offense to beat the Carolina Panthers. He's back on the yeah. 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 What a surprise. We got him now. <laughs> you know, the Panthers play in a two-year-old stadium, but that's not the newest facility in the NFL. Last Sunday, Washington played their first game in the new Jack Kent Cook Stadium. The first game at Jack Kent Cook Stadium became a celebration of the old and the new. First play in the new stadium. Hey, this is our ball. Let's take it to the house. One, two, three. The Arizona Cardinals began the game bent on spoiling the stadium's it's debut. Cardinals block it, and it's loose in the end zone and recovered for a touchdown. But the Redskins rallied in the second quarter to take a 10 to 7 lead. Rolling right into the end zone. Westbrook, touchdown, Washington Redskins. From six yards out, the Redskins have scored their first touchdown in a new stadium. 
In a day-long battle of field position and defense, Kevin Butler's field goal tied the game with just seconds remaining in the fourth quarter. It's good! Two seconds to go, and the Cardinals have tied it again. You don't need to play your ass off that long and then put up by doing something stupid, all right? Let's be sharp and aggressive and continue to attack their ass, all right? Let's win the game. Arizona had the first possession in overtime, but the Redskins looked to seize the win and the ball by stripping running back Leland McElroy. Two plays later, Washington cashed in when Michael Westbrook soared for his second touchdown of the game. The historic first victory at Jack Kent Cook Stadium evoked memories of the last game at RFK Stadium and stood as a poignant tribute to the Washington Redskins' beloved Patriarch. The Friday before we played Dallas in, the, in RFK, I went and saw Mr. Cook. He said, you gotta win this game. It's our last game here, last game ever. He says, you don't want to lose. The last game ever played here. And you guys won the game. Well, Thursday I walked in here. I could hear him saying, you gotta win this game. That's what hit me. It's the first game ever. First game ever here. And then I get to take away from him. You guys meant so much to him. Well, we're giving a game ball to John Cook today. Because this thing means just as much to him. This means a lot to all of us. It really does. Uh, not just for us, but for your family. We could feel you when you came in here. We could feel you, and God bless you. Thanks for sharing. It's a great team we have here. It's a great history we have here. And each one of you guys are very close to my heart and to my family's heart. Thank you very much. I'll treasure this always. Yes, sir. God bless you all. One, two, three. In Dallas Monday night, it all came down to the final snap, but early on, it was Philadelphia's Big D that had the pop. Aikman takes his clock. He's under the rush. He's hit. He fumbles the football. It's loose. It's picked up by Thomas. Thomas at the 20, at the 15, at the 10. Touchdown, William Thomas. The blitz. Eagles forced the Cowboys to settle for five field goals until Troy Aikman launched a do or die drive, trailing 20 to 15 in the final minutes. Aikman back pedals, Aikman rush, Aikman running. He is going to throw it into the end zone, and it is caught for a touchdown by Anthony Miller with 51 seconds left. Anthony Miller's clutch catch set the stage for a frenzied finish as Dallas led by one with time running out. Cowboys 21, Eagles 20, 16 seconds remaining. First and 10, the ball at midfield. Tepper back, Tepper looking, stepping up. He's going to fire the football, complete at the 30, at the 25, 20, at the 15, 10, running back of Solomon to the five. Four seconds left. Here we go. Take a big deep breath. Spotted. It's picked up by Hutton. Hutton's running with the football. It's over. He dropped the snap. He never got the snap. The Eagles dominated and led for 59 minutes, yet the Cowboys somehow escaped. A bye week lays ahead for both. One will spend it thanking his lucky stars, the other seeing stars. The Cowboys' incredible one-point win over the Eagles last week, just part of a trend in the National Football League. So far this season, 33% of the games have been decided by three points or less, as opposed to just 12% of the games at this time a season ago. Well, I'm 100% sure our own Gary Myers is going to give us some inside information at this point. And Gary, 
While we're talking about percentages, what are the chances that Mark Brunel will be the quarterback for Jacksonville this week? Well, Chris, Brunel has been taking 50% or more of the snaps in practice this week. Jacksonville upgraded him from doubtful to questionable. I think he's going to play. But when I spoke to Tom Coughlin, he wasn't ready yet to make that pronouncement. I think he's going to wait after sat until after Saturday's practice. The concern on Coughlin's part is, can Brunel protect himself against that Pittsburgh pass rush? Can he get out of the way and protect his knee? If he can't start, once again, it will be Steve Matthews because Rob Johnson's ankle is not ready. Okay, let's talk about what's going on in New England right now. A lot of rumors that the Patriots are about to move to Providence. And all indications are that Providence is ready to close that deal and that they will close the deal, although Foxborough is not 100% out of it as of yet. I know there's some concern around the league about this continuing trend of teams moving from the larger markets to the smaller markets and away from the big corporate sponsors. But there are two things you have to know about Rob Kraft, the Patriots owner, that last year he tried to privately finance a 270 million dollar stadium in South Boston and he was rejected in the last year he turned down an offer from Los Angeles to move the team there in which he would have retained 51 percent ownership been paid hundred million dollars and been given a new stadium this is a guy who says he will sell the team before he'll move it and I don't think he's selling yeah say what you want about Bob Kraft he is very loyal to that Boston area maybe he should talk to Bud Adams about moving a franchise from Houston to Tennessee and all the impact that that's had this is a dreadful situation the Oilers are based in Nashville they're playing the games in Memphis for the next two years they have not sold more than 20,000 tickets for any of their last seven home games they're only approaching 14,000 tickets for the game Sunday against Baltimore Now, Chris last year the NFL set up a rebate program for the visiting teams because the gate share was so low in Houston because of the small attendance. And when the league meets the middle of October in Dallas, don't be surprised if the owners ask Adams to set up another rebate program. They're not happy about these crowds in Memphis. All right, Gary, we'll see you in Green Bay next week. Okay, Chris. Well, if you're over 40 years old, you might remember Ernie Stotner as a Hall of Fame defensive tackle. If you're younger, you probably remember him as Tom Landry's defensive coordinator. Either way, Let's see where one of the game's true legends is now. Welcome to Germany, where Ernie Stottner continues his 47-year career in pro football. He was born here, but grew up in New York, and had to cover up his love for the game from his disapproving Bavarian-born yeah, parents. Why are you so sore? Why, why you got uh, bruises? And, and finally I said, My, well, I've I'm, I'm been fighting with the American guy, kids. And about the fifth time that happened, my father said to me, in Germany, he said, boy, th those must be pretty tough kids, those American kids. <laughs> well, with his gridiron secret exposed, Stotner proved to be the tough guy. The nine-time All-Pro defensive tackle excelled despite 15 hapless campaigns with the Pittsburgh Steelers of the 50s and 60s. People didn't like the players because we'd beat them up. I mean, we physically beat them up. We were tough, hard-nosed. We never had the material to win, but boy, we gave everybody a battle. Number 70's battle plan switched to player coach in his final seasons leading to a 23-year stint as Tom Landry's defensive coordinator and helping to shape the Cowboys' doomsday defense. Go right here. In Dallas, Stotner finally became world champion with two Super Bowl rings. But Jerry Jones' arrival ended future celebrations and his dream of becoming a head coach. Three years ago, Stotner tackled an unexpected offer with the reemergence of World League football in his birthplace. Splitting his time between Texas and Germany, his career-long frustration ended. This is something that was extremely fulfilling, to come back to the land in which I was born and then seeing the opportunity of uh, coaching football over here. Back on his native soil, the Frankfurt Galaxy initially embraced him as head coach. A player will only do what you demand of him, believe me. If you don't show him that something is important to you, he'll do it the way he wants to. And that's not the way I coach. One, two, three, eight. I know they let up. I knew they let up. Players love to do their own thing, but I won't have that. And his coaching style worked. His first season, Stockner won the World Bowl and Coach of the Year honors. 
He returned to the championship game in his second year, but this summer, the team missed the playoffs and management did not renew his contract. As long as I know I have the respect of the Galaxy players and the coaches and a lot of the fans, I'm leaving as a winner. At age 72, the Hall of Famer landed on his feet with the German Football League. Today, he's a special consultant for the Cologne Crocodiles. It was nice to show that you could do it. Most of the uh, people felt that I was satisfied where I was because I was there for so long. But that isn't the way I felt. It took Ernie Stottner's return to Europe to get and savor his role as head coach. German fans are glad he didn't give up on football. Ernie Stottner was a great player. He is a great individual. And he taught me a terrific lesson my rookie year, our first game when I'm waiting to go out. Everybody's getting introduced. I had my headgear in my hand. He said, rookie, put that headgear on. I said, why? I'm not starting. Just then, an empty beer can dropped at my feet. <laughs> he said, look at that, and we haven't lost a game yet. <laughs> Later on, it would be full beer cans coming at us. Let's take a look and see what we did last week in our pick segment. Oh, oh Mub, oh, pretty no, no, good. No, no, Only one it. game that's separating all accident, four. Man. But you guys want to feel a little humble? On our online service, 90 of our viewers were a perfect 13 and 0 last That's out of 5 million. <laughs> Something like that. Hmm, we aren't quite that good yet. For the season, fairly close again. Fairly close, I said. Now, early in the show, we picked several games. Now it's time to pick the rest. We all agree that Dan Reeves' Falcons will go 0-4 as the Niners will win again. We all agree that Dave Wanstead's Bears will go to 0-4 as they travel to New England. We all like Detroit to win in New Orleans as the Saints will stay winless no matter who plays quarterback. Indianapolis Colts still haven't scored an offensive touchdown. We like Buffalo to keep the Colts winless. The Giants and Dave Brown are playing better, but we all like the Rams to win in St. Louis. And San Diego makes a trip north of Seattle. We all like the Seahawks to win their second game in a row. Now for the rest of the games in more detail, let's start with Jerry because seldom is he at the top <laughs> of the board Never. getting this <laughs> Baltimore, <laughs> Baltimore, Tennessee, but folks, plenty of good seats still available there. Well, the Orioles got to feel good. They get their best defensive player back, all pro safety Blaine Bishop, plus they've had a bye week. I know their coaching staff, they've been practicing all kinds of new blitzes. They'll blitz the Ravens coming off the bus and beat them bloody. <laughs> You're not coaching this week. I just want to explain yeah. that to you. You know, last week the Giants ran awfully well against that Ravens defense, and Eddie George runs it a lot better than do the Giants. I like Tennessee here. I'll tell you, Baltimore has a weakness. It's their secondary. I think this is the week that Chris Sanders and Willie Davis step it up, take the pressure off of Eddie George. I like Tennessee. I want to talk about Baltimore's receiver. We got Michael Jackson, Derek Alexander, Eric Green. Vinny Testaverde will find one of those people Hello. for big, Hello. big plays. I like Baltimore. Minnesota at Green Bay. And folks, we'll be in Green Bay next week, regardless of what happens. And you know, Minnesota's defense is making Hall of Famers out of running backs <laughs> all over the league. This week, Dorsey Levins gets his shot. I like Green Bay. And I don't think Brett Favre is really feeling comfortable with his offense yet. That's why he's gone to Mark Schirmer most of the last couple of ball games. But this week here, I think his pal becomes Robert Brooks. I like Green Bay. Well, look at the Vikings secondary. Somebody look at those people. They're giving up big plays. You got Dwayne Washington and Corey Fuller. They had a field day of playing bad last week. Now Brett Favre coming against him. It's going to be a laugher. Vikings have a terrific running back, Robert Smith, when he gets the ball. But he's not going to get the ball very much like last week because they're going to be playing catch-up. I like Green Bay. Oakland at the Jets. And, Nick, the Jets have lost 13 consecutive home games. Yeah, but Neil O'Donnell's been sacked 15 times in the last two ball games. Oakland had six sacks last week against Atlanta. Darrell Russell, the rookie, had two sacks. He's just getting it going. I like Oakland. How about the Jets' defense? Uh -huh. Last week, Curtis Martin, they gave up 199 yards on the grass. <laughs> this week, Napoleon Kaufman <laughs> on turf. Run all over him. Watch the Raiders rush that ball. <laughs> I can't do. I can't help him. I'm trying. I can't help him. I like Adrian Morell in this game for whatever reason. Last week, Bill Parcells just forgot about him in the second half. This week, he gets a full load. The Jets win. Last week, the Jets had no pressure on the quarterback, and that was without their top rusher, Hugh Douglas. He is questionable. 
for this game. Whether he plays or not, I like Oakland. We got Pittsburgh at Jacksonville. The Steelers are 10 and 1 under Bill Cower on Monday night. Jerry, tell us about it. It doesn't matter. Let me tell you about the Steelers' <laughs> secondary. So. <laughs> Nine plays over 20 yards in just two ball games. They're going to get burned this week with Jimmy Smith and McCarl. Those receivers are run all over him. Jacksonville in a big win. <laughs> this man a towel, man. They're, they're <laughs> sweating all over everybody, man. <laughs> Jerome Bettis is a one man show for the Pittsburgh Steelers right now. Last year, Jacksonville in those two games handled him very well. I like the Jaguars. Hey, match up here. Joe Steed, the nose tackle for Pittsburgh. Dave Wydell, the center for Jacksonville. This is going to be a heck of a matchup. I think Wydell wins it, and that means Natron means will have a big game. I like Jacksonville. Let's hit, talk about the quarterback situation with Jacksonville. We already heard that Mark Brunel has been practicing. Rob Johnson has not. Steve Matthews is there. If I were them, I would save Mark Brunel for later on because Cordell Stewart has not been doing very much for the Steelers. I like Jacksonville. That's our show for this week. Remember, Inside the NFL premieres each Thursday evening at 11 p.m. If you miss any part of it, you can catch it again Fridays at 7 p.m. and Saturdays at 11 a.m. And remember to check out our popular website at HBO.com. Make your picks against us each week. Join us again next week from Green Bay, Wisconsin, Titletown, USA, where we'll focus on the defending Super Bowl champions. And so for Nick, Chris, and Jerry, I'm Lynn Dawson. We'll see you next week from Green Bay, Wisconsin. I'm Bryant Gumbel. Next stop on Real Sports. Is country club racism par for the course? They are in violation, for as I'm concerned, of the law because they're discriminating. Real Sports uncovers reports of discrimination that will really tee you off. And someone actually put the words KKK on his, on his locker. Prejudice among the privileged. The Emmy Award winning Real Sports with Bryant Gumbel. Premieres Tuesday, September 23rd on HBO. Real Sports. Nothing is out of bounds. You talked me out of the lag and we threw the sluggo. You talked me out of that one and we threw the U corner. You know, the art of persuasion. That's you. You got it. Yeah, I know I got to keep it down. Yeah. Yeah. You rushed a little bit. And for future reference, Chris Walsh was wide open on the backside. Just, just for next time we do it. No, we were just telling him next time it's up. Fourth quarter, they're down 15 points. They're going to do things like that. So you're right. Game. We're not saying you're wrong. Right. You're right. I saw it late, too. But you got to be at the point of the game where you understand that's what you're going to start doing, okay? So now you have to be a little bit more aware. Another second or two, look at it. Just be aware of the situation. <laughs> Celebrating 25 years.